welcome to the Vineyard. Uh, if you're joining us tonight, uh, if you can see us from home, we're glad to have you. This is our second fully online service. And we always, at the Wellsboro Vineyard, we always on the fifth Sunday have the youth take over. So since we can't get the youth together at this point, I happen to have a whole lot of youth that live in my own house. So they're all here with me, and we have a band of, of the Ruth family uh, here to lead worship for us. So we hope you'll join us. Um, if you look further down on the Facebook page, Alicia actually posted the chords to the song. So if you have an instrument, pull it out. We're doing all easy songs in the key of G, so you can feel free to play with us, and please uh, engage in worship with us as we get started. So I'm just going to pray, and then we'll get going. Lord, we just commit this night to you. We thank you that we could gather together tonight, even though it's virtually. We ask that you would come, Holy Spirit, um, and lead us tonight, and just touch people's hearts through this worship and through the teaching. In Jesus' name, amen.
weeks. Just as we finish up worship here, I'm just thinking, um, you know, there's a lot of anxiety and a lot of nobody knows what's going to happen next. But it's it's great that we can get together virtually and um, and share this time. And I know that God has something He wants to share with each of us tonight. Whether you are here in this room on the stage with me. continue to just weather these um, unprecedented situations. Um, though I personally would prefer that we all be gathering together here tonight, um, I am so thankful that we have an opportunity uh, to gather together virtually. So um, post in our comments today where, where you're watching us from and uh, how you're enjoying the service. Um, I just have a couple of announcements that we're going to go through tonight. Um, since kind of the world is slowly slowed to a halt, we don't have a lot going on, but um, one thing that is going on is our Vineyard Bible Scavenger Hunt. We have been working um, on a way just to help keep people connected, keep people engaged, and uh, so we've developed this scavenger hunt as a way to uh, connect with the church, but also dig into God's Word. As we're quarantined at home, um, with finding a little more time on our hands, uh, it's a good time to dig into what God's Word says. And so if you're an adult or a child, uh, we have a um, Bible scavenger hunt. Adults, you would read the book of Mark um, with the hunt list and write down the verses that you uh, found the different words in. Uh, kids, you're going through the book of Jonah and doing the same thing. And so if you check your email or our Facebook uh, page, you will see links to those hunt lists. And then if you finish them up, send them back to me. Um, your name will be entered in for a drawing to win a prize. The other announcement I want to make is um, 
the Easter basket and egg collection that we were doing all month for um, Tioga County Human Services. Uh, I know many people took baskets and eggs. Um, they are not going to be doing their egg hunt, but we still want to get those baskets or eggs to uh, Tioga County Human Services so they can distribute them to the families that need them. So if you would please contact me at my email, brett at wellsborovineyard.org, or you can Facebook message me, or you can call. Let me know if you have baskets or eggs to be picked up, and at, throughout this week we'll get those picked up from you so we can deliver them to human services. Also, uh, working on other ways to stay connected, um, so just keep your eye on our Vineyard newsletter and our Facebook page for new and exciting ways to connect virtually. Um, if you are joining us for the first time, we just want to extend a welcome to you. We hope that you enjoy our live service. Um, and as a first time guest, we typically would hand you a gift bag. Uh, but if you are watching for the first time, send us a message and we will do our best to get you the contents of that welcome bag uh, via mail. So check that out. Um, also, in just a moment, we're going to be posting a link to our digital connection card. Um, that's the way we stay connected at the Vineyard, so take a moment to fill that out. Uh, we're going to take a short break now to uh, reset kind of our stage area. Um, that's a great time to uh, fill out that connection card, um, or you can grab another drink, or just get comfy and cozy in your couch or, or recliner for the message. Um, also, in just a moment, you'll get links to our online giving platform and, and um, the bulletin. So hang tight. We're going to take a five-minute break, and we will be back for tonight's message. So we pour 
the English Standard Version tonight. So if you'd like to turn uh, in your Bibles or to your um, devices, or you can follow along in the slides as they appear, we're going to be reading James 4, uh, verses 11 and 12. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity just to gather in this place together um, and in homes throughout our region, Lord. We thank you that we have technology that can bring us together in one heart and one mind, um, even at a great distance. And so we just ask, uh, Lord, uh, that through your Holy Spirit, you would speak to each one of us tonight um, in a special way, that we would encounter you um, wherever we're watching you. In your holy name we praise and thank you. Amen. So for the next few minutes, we're going to be talking about judgment-free living. Uh, most everyone joining us this evening has probably had an experience or multiple experiences where you have been judged by someone else. And if you're being completely honest, many of us most likely have experienced a time or two where we have passed judgment on someone. Uh, whether we like it or not, part of living in a broken world with a sinful nature uh, leads us to almost instinctively uh, judge others even when we know we shouldn't as followers of Jesus. We read verses like this one in James or others like it. For example, Matthew 7, 1 through 5. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Or another verse, John 8, um, 
is the story of, of the woman caught in adultery. And in verse 7 it says, And they continued to ask him, and he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And yet, after reading verses and commands from the Bible like that, there's still this tendency to pass judgment on others. I think sometimes we do it without even thinking about it. Uh, it just seems to be such a natural part of living in our culture today, inside and outside the church. We see this happening inside the churches that James is addressing in his letter. If you remember, uh, James is writing to Jewish Christians that are scattered across the nations. Um, and last week we talked a little bit about the conflict that was running rampant in the, those churches that were scattered and in the body of believers. And how those conflicts were then leading people to conflicts in their relationship with God. And as we move on, James is now almost naming some of the things that were causing conflicts. One of them, the judgmental attitudes that they had towards one another. So verse 11 again says, Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judge his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. And so James is very candidly and very directly saying that by speaking slanderously about others, um, you're judging. You're making judgments about those, those people. Um, and he says, uh, when you speak against the law, you're, you're judging the law, and, and you're putting yourself above the lawgiver. Now, if you know me, you know I have five children, um, and our oldest is uh, a young woman now, but her name is Lauren. Um, and when Lauren uh, was um, four, or almost four, she had, uh, we had another, our second, first son, Landon. And, um, as a four-year-old who, who was very active um, and wanted to be involved, we, when the new baby came, allowed her to grab diapers and allowed her to grab bottles, and she grew up as this great big sister. Um, a couple years later, we had another baby, and a couple years after that, another baby. And um, as Lauren grew, she developed this responsibility. However, um, she at points in that time frame, the responsibility she took was a, a little too great. And we had a saying in our house that said, Lauren, repeat after me, I am not the mother. And we would make her repeat that. You see, Lauren had the tendency to know the rules and enforce them with her siblings. Um, she would sometimes say they couldn't watch a certain show, or they had to, once in a while she'd even put them in time out. She took on the role of a parent, a role that wasn't hers to take. And so what James is saying here is the same thing. When we judge, we're taking on a role that we weren't given. Um, if you follow along in the bulletin tonight, the first point is, when we pass judgment on others, we elevate ourselves above the law and the law giver. Lauren, when she would take charge of her siblings, would sometimes elevate herself above her parents. She took on that role, again, that wasn't hers to take. So James is telling these Christians that by speaking evil of one another and by judging others, they are putting themselves in a place of authority above the law and God. Now the law James is referring to is the greatest and second greatest commandments given to us by Jesus. Matthew 22 says, And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. When we pass judgment on someone, we are essentially contradicting that second law. Love your neighbor as yourself. And we're promoting ourselves um, a, a, from someone who is a doer of the law to the authority over the law. 
And it's not a position we're intended to hold. One thing that I'm, I'm very used to uh, over the last several years is um, going to high school sports contests. Uh, our son Holden was in uh, soccer and basketball and track, and so we are always at um, the high school watching some sort of contest. And as a player in the game, you know the rules, you take the field, let's say in soccer, and, and you play by the rules. But there's also someone there to enforce the rules, the referee. And so the referee is there. He makes sure that the game is following the rules that are set. The referee knows the rules. He doesn't play the game, but he knows the rules, and he is set to enforce them over the other players. God didn't make us the referee. He made us the players. Jesus is the only one with authority to judge. Jesus is the referee. James 4.12 says, There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? There isn't a lot more to say about this verse. Jesus is the one that's been given authority to referee. He's the one that knows the law, and he's the one that's given been authority to judge. John 5.22 says, For the Father judges no one. He has given all judgment to the Son. At the end of each sports contest, after the teams come to an end, um, whether it's basketball or football or soccer, the referee is the official judge of that contest. He confirms that, that the rules were followed, he confirms the score, and he says which team wins and loses. He's the official that states the outcome of that game or match. He officially reports the outcome. This is the authority given to Jesus. He is the official judge that will say, when the final day comes, who spends eternity where? James says, he who is able to save and to destroy. But here's the good news. We can be assured of that outcome when we put our trust in Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus is the judge. And he's been given authority by his Father in heaven. But we've also been given a way to make sure that when that final day comes, that we're with Jesus, that he chooses our eternity, and that he chooses to save us. Jesus came to earth and lived a, a, a life without sin so that he could take our sins to a cross. And he died on that cross for us so that we, we might be free from sin. And the news is better because three days later, Jesus was resurrected. He came back to life. And when he came out of that grave, he made us new creations. And he bridged this gap between us and God. And when we accept that sacrifice, and we ask forgiveness of our sins, we can be assured that Jesus, as the authority, the judge, will mark us as saved. And at the vineyard, we, salvation is, is a simple prayer. Asking, asking Jesus, uh, we say sorry, thank you, please. And we say, sorry, God, for the things that we've done that keep us separated from you. Thank you for sending us Jesus. And thank you, Jesus, for taking those sins, our sins, to the cross and dying for us. And please, please forgive us and help us to follow after you and your example so that one day we will be with you and our Heavenly Father in eternity. 
I invite you to pray that prayer now. And if you do it for the first time, wherever you may be watching, please contact me. I'd love to talk to you about next steps and, and what comes after that prayer. So this topic of passing judgment, it seems pretty straightforward. Yet, if you take a moment to kind of think through the social and cultural climate of today, these scriptures are used by non-believers and some believers against the church. We live in a time where, as a Christian, the minute you open your mouth on a wide variety of topics, you are immediately deemed judgmental. You immediately hear verses like Matthew 7 or John 8 or James 4, and they get thrown in your face. So one of two things happens in that case. The first one is we just stop saying anything about any subject that may invoke someone to call us judgmental. We clam up and we shut up. Or the other thing, we make the comments anyway and with the wrong motives and out of spite, we cause further conflict. If you want an example, you can scroll through Facebook and find many feeds where that takes place. The problem with both of those two approaches is that it's not loving your neighbor as yourself. If we clam up and shut up, we're not loving those that are making harmful choices, eternal choices. And if we just let everything run out of our mouth, we're not loving our neighbor because we're causing additional conflict. The truth is, though we are not permitted to judge, we are encouraged to use or discernment. As I was researching this week, I found a great kind of description of what discernment means. It's the ability to make discriminating judgments to distinguish between and recognize the moral implications of different situations and courses of action. It includes the ability to weigh up and assess the moral and spiritual status of individuals, groups, and movements. Discernment means we go to God who knows all things to distinguish what is biblically right in regards to people, situations, and teachings. When we use discernment, it impacts the way we live. It protects and guards us from spiritual, uh, being spiritually deceived, it's an instrument of healing when we exercise it. It's a key to freedom as it points us towards God's standards. And it serves as a catalyst to spiritual growth and development. So though we are discouraged from passing judgment, we are instructed to discern. Matthew 7, 6, right after Jesus talks about not judging others or, and will be judged the same way that we judge. Uh, he says, do not give dogs what is holy and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. What Jesus is saying is discern who you trust to give those pearls to. 1 John 4, 1 says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Again, we're encouraged to discern. Where we go wrong as believers is we judge others and call it discernment. They're not the same. They each stem from the motives of the heart. Judgment comes from a self-centered motive of our heart, while discernment comes from the heart of God. In my research this week, I found a really good article that helped me to kind of draw a line between being judgmental and discernment. And this is not an exhaustive list, I'm sure, but it was helpful for me. And I'm just going to give you a few of the things they listed. You judge someone when you criticize them rather than trying to build them up. The second one, assume you know all the facts and motives behind a person's words or actions. 
You judge someone when you focus on human standards rather than holding to God's standards. One of the biggest issues of the Pharisees were they had all these additional man-made rules that were never given by God that they made people uphold. And then they judged them against those man-made standards um, that weren't necessary. You judge someone when you share confidential or personal information with the wrong intentions. And you judge someone when you make an authoritative pronouncement about their faith or their eternal destiny. Again, we're not the authority, Jesus is. Now for discernment. You are not judging someone, but using discernment when you are being discerning in regards to a person's character or teaching. If we look at that passage in Matthew 7, Jesus told us not to judge, but he follows it up by saying, be discerning in who you trust those pearls with. Later on in chapter 7 of Matthew, we're warned to discern against false prophets and false teachings. We're not judging and using discernment. Number two is when we speak to someone and sometimes others about sin or false teachings and belief. Imagine for a moment you're out in the yard and your young child goes running towards the, the road where there are, is heavy traffic. You do whatever you could to, to stop and get to them first before they got hit by a vehicle. Sometimes in this Christian life we live, we may see a brother or sister in Christ who, who is making choices that are incorrect, are harmful spiritually. And so we're encouraged to discern how best to speak to them about that. Galatians 6.1 urges us to do this gently. We use discernment when we evaluate spiritual maturity for ministry or shepherding purposes, we're called to make disciples. And as we make disciples, we have to discern sometimes where people are at and how to help them grow. Lori and I, with all our children, when they reach their junior year, we have a conversation of our, about our kids and, and where we see weaknesses and where we see strengths and how, how to together work to prepare them for adulthood in this world. And so it's a discernment process. We're not judging their spiritual behavior or attitudes. We're discerning how, where they're at and how best to help them. The key in all of this is the motive. Our motive should always be Love the love and well-being of people. Judgment-free living won't just happen in our lives. Like most of the things James teaches, we have to intentionally focus our hearts towards God. We are instructed to love our neighbor and not judge them. And as believers, we need to get better at loving our neighbors with a spirit of discernment with the easy topics as well as the difficult ones so that we both draw closer to Jesus. So we're going to put up some application questions to think through this this week. Have you ever felt judged by another person? How did their judgment make you feel? Have you ever been accused of passing judgment on another person? How did that make you feel? How does it make you feel hearing that passing judgment on another person puts you in an elevated position above the law and the lawgiver? What questions can you develop to help you use discernment versus judgment? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this night. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us our, your word to instruct us, even in some of the difficult things, Lord. But we thank you that it is practical, Lord. Uh, we live in a world where um, people are constantly being judged. And Father, as authentic uh, believers who want to live a faith that is real, 
and genuine. Help us, God, to be people that, that are discerning and not judging, Lord. Show us how to best do that, Father, that, that together with the people we encounter, we can draw closer to you. In your holy name, we praise and thank you. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. That This is the end of our service. Um, please have a great week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and check out our Facebook page and your email for more exciting things that we'll be doing um, over the course of the next couple weeks. Um, until that time, God bless.